Hello, Johnny Chiodini here, full-time beard haver and part-time DM for the Outside Xbox and Outside Extra Dungeons & Dragons crew. Running tabletop campaigns for this lot has taken a terrible toll on me. I'm only 14 years old. And I'm determined that the hardships that I, as a dungeon master, have endured not be suffered by any of you. To that end, and to celebrate the launch of brand new tabletop YouTube channel Dicebreaker, run by me, here are seven ways your players will try to derail you. DMs, be wary of the following. You manage to get sort of a negative print of the, um, of, of the invoice, and uh, basically it doesn't have any identifying names or marks or anything. It just says collection docs. 3 a.m. Come alone. Brackets. Be prepared to make many trips. Guys. Yeah. Yeah. Com combined with Corazon's clues, <laughs> this makes me think that we need to go to the docks tonight. So you might remember in Bad Chair Day, at the end of the adventure, I admitted that I had never been derailed quite so badly for quite so long by the Ox Venturers, and the reason for that was they went off on a 40 to 45 minute tangent that I hadn't planned for. And to be honest with you, part of this was my fault because they were looking for evidence of where these evil chairs had come from. And I think it was Dob found a piece of parchment that talked about meeting at the docks. And it was something like, be prepared to make several trips, which was just an off the cuff joke about there being lots of furniture. So they needed to ferry lots of it back and forth. But they took that to mean that there was going to be a meeting at the docks that night. And they were like, well, we've got to go check this out. Definitely. We're off to the docks, right? Yeah. Dob with your clues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 3 a.m. at the docks. Should you think we should go there now and just like wait? Oh, 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 we should spring a trap. We should not not be there. We're conspicuous. We should be hiding on rooftops. And there was no way for me to be like, no, you're just chasing like a complete red herring here. All I wanted was for them to go and talk to some furniture manufacturers and they just didn't. Even when, I mean, in order to get them to realize I had to ship Coruscant out to sea with Merylwen and have them jump in the ocean to realize that, hey, maybe all of this is just innocuous. You get thrown overboard. Oh, <laughs> right, well, I guess I'm heading back to shore. Okay. Uh, Merylwen, do you want a lift? Is there any advantage to Merylwen now being on the boat or should she like book it back to land? What do you think? Is our spy, Egbert? do you mean? I feel, yeah. like, I feel like the uh, the, the Boat is a bit red herring. Yeah, I, think I feel like the, the warehouse isn't involved might be the in place the... to go and have a look. So that was, was that the real adventure, though. I mean, it was time spent on that boat doing nothing. For me, that was the the most panic-inducing live show we've done because we had a countdown clock on the on the the stage, and I remember looking at it and thinking, "Great." We're at square one, but we're half an hour down, <laughs> and I don't know how to speed this up. So, yeah, that was a test. The lesson I learned from Bad Chair Day was to be more specific in the information I leave around the world, not to give ideas for things that have to be illustrated in order for the players to understand that they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna drop the mask for a second here. You have never derailed me that hard <laughs> <laughs> for that long. Yeah. Ever. I was on We're a heroes. Boat. Not like no offense to obviously any of the players, but you always just you you try and pitch something about their level of intelligence, <laughs> <laughs> and then you have that intelligence. Massive offense taken. So basically, you're saying no fun nor flavor in the in the instructions. Just all caps. Facts. Go to the docks, you idiots. Don't go to the docks. Oh, sorry. No, don't go. Sorry. I will get there, Johnny. Case in point. <laughs> <laughs> what what happened? It was that bloody bottle of thing. <laughs> I bought it from the market. I drank it. Now I'm a chicken. I'm down the bottle. And I'm getting kicked. Um, and I don't know what this tiefling's doing. But it's holding me very tightly. I'm sorry. Can you can you loosen the grip on it a little bit? Oh! oh the chicken's. Oh. Ah! <laughs> the chicken hits the deck with a sort of meaty thud. It's not very really used to being a chicken. <laughs> During the very first Ox Venture, the spicy rat caper, there were supposed to be lots of people in the town who'd been affected by. M. Chanel's Miracle Elixir. So I wanted them to visit several houses of different sort of social levels in order to, to realize that this was a problem affecting everybody and they really needed to track down who was responsible. And sort of as like a tiny clue that I honestly didn't think they'd pick up on, I let a rat scurry out of the room in the very first bedroom they went into with the very, very posh people. So as he opens the door, you see uh, quite, a, quite a fine bedroom. Clearly uh, the Mayweathers are doing all right for themselves. There's, there's lots of sort of fine drapery and things like that. So slightly odd that a rat just 
kind of runs out and scatters down the down the corridor. Obviously, these being Dungeons and Dragons players, they just fixated solely on that. They were like, there was a rat here. It's vitally important we find it. My son's been taken. I, I don't, I don't care about vermin. But we feel that the rat may have seen something. What if the rat was here when your son yeah. was taken? The rat, by the way, is not here. The rat, rat we're going to find down the, the corridor. Okay. <laughs> we're going to chase the rat I knocked now. through a wall Fine. looking for the rat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, we've, we're convinced this rat Fine. is in on it. So obviously, Andy was like, I'm going to go catch that rodent. I'd made it a difficult check because it had had some time to escape and it's hard to catch a rat with your bare hands. What's your modifier? On intelligence, plus yeah. four. <laughs> If that was the jab, the hook was Ellen starting to talk to this rat, which I was sort of prepared for, but I wasn't prepared for her to give us a long list of questions, followed by, and are you the missing boy? <laughs> was there anything that came through the window? Did anything leave the window? Were, were there, was there one person? And I also asked the rat, <laughs> are you him? <laughs> Just in case. <laughs> you gotta are say you, if you are. Are you the son? <laughs> Cut to the chase, the rat looks at you and says, yes. So it's him, it's the boy. <laughs> so they skipped ahead about 20 minutes, which in and of itself isn't really a problem for a DM because you can just make something else last a bit longer or they'll definitely find time to faff in like a bit you didn't anticipate. But it's just the feeling of not being quite ready. It's like that feeling where you're about to leave the house and somebody walks in and you'd be like, are you good to go? When like you're, you're brushing your teeth or like having a wee. I think that was mostly a panic. And I remember we sort of had a, a little bit of a filming break at some point. And I remember Andy being like, do, you, do, we need to, do we need to go back and pretend that didn't happen? Have I completely screwed this quest? And I was like, no, no. I am just now, uh, my heart rate is about 120 BPM. What did I learn from that? It would be keep your cool and always try and have in mind what, what's gonna happen a bit further down the line because if they manage to just like neatly excise a chunk of your quest you weren't anticipating, you're gonna have to catch up and just the, the key there is not to panic, which I learned the hard way. It's, it's pubby, it's, it's, um, it's people having ales in pints and courts and over in the corner is a man in a very like pristine linen suit with a sort of hat with sort of a domed top and a wide brim. Um, he's drinking quite heavily from a bottle of brandy and he has a raggedy sign in front of him that simply says, Adventurers Wanted. So NPCs are one of the most important tools a DM has because they are the only way really to give the players a little steer when they need it and to give them information and give them adversaries and things like that. But the problem with putting a piece on the board is that other people can interact with it. And the Ox Venturers have done some really horrible things to my NPCs in the past. They had it coming. <laughs> Alfred Strangestar did not have it coming. I, sh I should introduce myself, really. My, my name's um, Alfred. Um, Alfred, Alfred Strangestar. Um, I fancy myself a bit of an adventurer myself, but... Um, uh... Escort mission. <laughs> <laughs> Alfred Strangetide was meant to be this kind of quite tall, sort of lithe, like adventurer type who sort of like runs around and is like, this is fascinating. And he was supposed to be sort of going off and zipping about the place because he's so excited as this academic. Basically, he was meant to be initiating bits of the, the action by being like, look at this, this is fascinating. You might have missed this minor detail. So then what they did was they strapped him to Dob. <laughs> Where are we putting our, um, you know, Archibald, whatever his face was? Oh. <laughs> We carry him aloft. Yeah. Down the you, this doesn't seem entirely safe. Dob has fashioned a papoose for him. <laughs> <laughs> Bouncing along in at the like front. Like a mother kangaroo. Yeah. Really. He is, to be fair, he is having a great time here already. <laughs> just, this is incredibly exciting. So he couldn't really move around. And obviously I could be like, ooh, look at this. But by that point, they'd started to patronise him so heavily. And to be fair to them, I thought that was very funny. So I started leaning into it. Here's a torch. Uh, he's just trying to do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No chorus oh. one. Damn it. I think the exact quote was, what have you done to my lovely NPC? Because he had been transfigured into this hairy toddler who was just getting really upset because obviously he was arguing with the pirate who didn't want to give him a fair share of the money. I wanted 70-30. Well, you can't have it, young man. Oh. <laughs> that 
That's it, I'm turning the quest around. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no! All right, 80-20! So that one, I mean, Strange Side was more fun than it was harrowing for me. I mean, it was still, like, quite a significant derailment during uh, a session. That, it was like our first dungeon crawl, and I was a little bit nervous about running it. But that's kind of nothing compared to the times when they take a really minor NPC. It's like, what's going on in here, then? And he is the, the quintessential, like, burly, paunchy, like, just not really taking care of himself prison guard. Who they're meant to just be done with in one second, and they punt them into, like, the, the, like, right on stage and make them really, really significant. This doesn't have to be the end for you. Come with us. No, don't. What? No. I know there's good in you, Jailer, I just met. See in your eyes. I didn't want to do this. What's your name, by the way? Seeing as we're going to be spending some time together. <laughs> Probably a good and interesting, well thought out name, I expect. Christopher... Engelbert. Engelbert the 17th. the 17th. He was meant to be a guard with a key. He was meant to get knocked out, and he was meant to have his pockets picked. And instead, he was given this weird motivational speech and thrust into the limelight. <laughs> Your new life begins today, Christopher. You can dream the impossible. You can do it. And we're here to help that happen. To the point where he was, like, crucial to the final confrontation. And I'm there being like, I don't know who this guy is. <laughs> Frantically trying to flesh out a character. Um, I guess what I learned there was just not to leave myself exposed and, and put flimsy characters in front of them. If I'm going to give the Oxventurers a chance to interact with somebody, I need to know their family history, <laughs> I need to know their national insurance number. <laughs> it just absolutely everything needs to be right at the tips of my fingers. Otherwise, you just get a situation where they're, they're basically requesting features, like they should have a really long name with lots of <laughs> syllables. It's just not fair at all. <laughs> Just said, oh, Engelbert tripped as he was leaving the cell and uh, smashed his head open and died. Yeah, I just don't want to railroad people like that and be like, no, no, I need this NPC to going back to go back to being really obscure. That like, kind of like it feels like I'm forcing your hand. We would have rioted. <laughs> yeah, I think if I'd taken that guard away, you would have gone looking for another one. <laughs> the, the quest would have taken so much longer. Where did you get all of the stone? It's <laughs> skeletons. Yes. Where did you guys get the stone for this? <laughs> the orphanage. <laughs> Skeletons! What are you like? <laughs> Skeletons fix town hall. You guys are hilarious. <laughs> so one of the funny things about doing the Oxventure live shows is that I need to watch them all back in order to remember what happened because I know this has happened to the players as well, like when you're up there, it's such an adrenaline rush, it goes by like that and you don't know what you said. So in order to kind of try and keep the future bits fairly consistent, I'd watch them back so I can keep up with what it was we were doing when we all temporarily delved into a fugue state together. And with the, uh, the, the loophole skeletons one, my favourite moment, because I always have a, a moment where I'm like, I can see something that I don't think anyone else is going to spot because they don't know what I was thinking at the time. There is a moment during that uh, Oxventure when I am bricking it. Because the trick with the skeletons, uh, the 60 who serve Ethel Frith, the builder, is that they will do whatever task it is you give them but they will do it at kind of a terrible cost that you don't really see coming. It's kind of like the monkey paw thing, where it grants your wishes, but it's, it can be terrible. So we need you to fix this building. Okay, they dismantle the orphanage to do it. Put the orphanage back together. Let's use the orphans as mortar. What, 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 what stone did you use? Stone boss from Quarry. What about the mortar? Is it orphans? You've got to tell us if it is. <laughs> ah. Orphans bust. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, they were always going to do something terrible. They've dismantled the orphanage and they're about to put it back together, but Luke starts saying, without harming anybody or anything, skeletons, we need you too. And it was that specificity that he basically, he'd solved the puzzle before we have managed to get another punchline out of it and I was panicking. Skeletons, mm. without uh, hurting or disadvantaging anyone, <laughs> um, why don't you um, continue to do a fantastic job 
by building an orphanage out of this stone. And you can just see me kind of staring at the table like, how do I get out of this? I mean, selfishly, I was like, I really want to mash these orphans up because <laughs> I think it'll be so funny. And luckily, um, everyone else sort of saved me because they went back and forth a bit more, being like, no, we should do this. No, we should do this. So I was then able to be like, what is the plan? And Dob was like, just rebuild the orphanage. And he didn't give me that specificity a second time. So I was like, yes, that's my in. Let's kill some children. I would like you please to build the orphanage first, if that's if that's cool. You guys build are, orphanage. You guys are doing a great mm -hmm. job. Yes, build the orphanage, please. Simple. Thank you. Can get, build orphanage. Fine. Yes, yes, cool. All right. So what you're saying is Dob is responsible for those. Oh, Dob is 100% responsible, yeah. yes. So okay, let's be clear, clear, clear on that. At first, his intentions were pure, which I kind of feel describes the Oxventurers as a whole <laughs> pretty well. I think if somebody was planning to do a similar thing and kind of have, uh, you know, a loophole something or have a uh, an external entity with caveats. I think the best way to do it is just to try and think of a second way it works. If they accidentally cut off one thing by say, being very specific, something else happens. I guess if if Luke had been really specific, maybe I would have had the skeletons, like some of the skeletons explode or something. You know, just trying to find some ways to redirect their behavior or make what they said not matter. <laughs> if the beast intelligence is four or higher, the spell fails. And our bear's intelligence is three. Oh, Amazing. so what? I have to make a wisdom saving throw, or be charmed. The the owl bear <laughs> will be charmed. Books you're <laughs> yeah. Surely this can't be right. The thing about running a, a very time sensitive campaign like the Ox Venture, especially when it's a live show, is that combat always takes forever. And so I kind of try and keep it to one, maybe two brief combat encounters per episode. And generally it makes sense for the combat encounter to be sort of a boss battle. And you expect this to be like that, okay, here we go. It's knives out time. This is gonna be really messy. A gargantuan mechanical stag beetle. Oh my oh God. Starts to stomp its way in. Unless you're running a game for the Oxventurers, in which case they will find some way to just derail the boss fight and circumnavigate it entirely. Standing over a very large cauldron, stirring vigorously, is uh, a gnome. I move in to grab and restrain the druid. Ooh. Okay. From behind him. Well, 18. Nice. Wait, plus? Plus, plus zero. Oh, right, sorry. Yeah, you uh, you grappled the, the heck out of yes. that. Yes. Uh, Take that, you stupid Child. gnome. Yeah. <laughs> when they first came up against M. Chanel and they just picked him up and <laughs> pinned his arms, I was desperately, I was, I was looking up um, Entangle to try and use, you know, his vines to, to capture everyone and, and start the fight proper. And then I realised that he needs to have his hands free to do it. And I thought, oh. So then I looked at his other spells and it's true of every single one of them. So they had just inadvertently completely rendered him powerless. And there was nothing I could do. See also the, the owlbear. I'm going to try and cast. Animal friendship. I just didn't expect them to walk up and be like, hi, cutie. <laughs> but that's exactly what happened. And technically, actually, I broke the rules because the uh, tame beast spell shouldn't work on monsters. But at that point, it was such a brilliant plan. I thought, I just I want to roll with this. I'm going to roll this one in the open. OK. Go on. That's a six. Oh, my god. <laughs> Ellen, we don't get to fight an owlbear now! Oh. Let's kill it anyway! Yes. What do you say to the owlbear? Hey, hey buddy! It, it was my own weakness that I was like, I like this plan and I want to reward it and I think it will be funny that it happened. But it was just another time where I thought, this is it, they've, they've got round an encounter I had planned. My main takeaway from them avoiding boss battles uh, is kind of twofold. It's like, number one, sometimes you will just be robbed of a boss battle and that's okay. It happens, just, just deal with it. They'll feel like absolute heroes because they managed to get around the big evil without taking a single point of damage and they've still saved the day. So, you know, that's good for them, I guess. And the other one is actually a tip I learned from my very first GM. If you want your players to have an easy fight, 
and feel like badasses. Give them one big thing to fight. If you actually want to mess them up, give them lots of little things to fight. Because the idea is it's kind of like a swarm. If you give them more things to have to deal with than they can actually deal with in like the one attack or two attacks they're permitted in a turn, they're gonna start taking hits and they're gonna get really scared. And I kind of feel like that worked in the skeleton fight. All these dice roll. Oh my, oh my god. god. You take 13 points of damage. Oh. Of a total of 18. Yes. You're not, not in trouble. Guys, <laughs> I'm not, not in trouble. It was terrifying, yeah. Yeah. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I guess uh, you you clump over to the the pirate skiff, um, yeah. mm -hmm. followed then... by some mm -hmm. you know like a trail of squid sort of following you along yeah. there. Occasionally, there's a whale sort of breaching. Yeah. To, <laughs> it feels like doing something. <laughs> I'm Do you think you could ask the whale to just fully breach into the ship? That's what I was wondering. I'm let's, gonna ask. That might let's destroy. The ship. Yeah, let's not damage the ship. Hey guys. Uh, no, just give it a nudge a though, not to actually just damage to, the ship, just to but everyone. to unbalance it and make everyone lose their footing. Like also, yeah, if, if we get the whale to do that as we're approaching, then it will stop them being able to retaliate with cannon fire. One of the special things about D&D that makes it really fun for people to play is that you get lots of options with magic, which is great, but it also means I've got lots of things to bear in mind when I want something to go smoothly and not get completely like sent off on some random other path, and I think there's no better example of this in practice than that time they used a whale to ram a ship. Obviously, Marilwen can communicate with animals and she can sort of send out this, uh, this message and, and become friends with them. The call that you put out into the water is answered by um, like a few Humboldt squid, and they're like really nasty. They're really <laughs> yeah. horrible, they're little weird sort of yeah. sucking tentacle beaks. Uh, let's say a couple of sharks. There's, you can sense that the whale you tried to reach out to is like, like I get it, but he's, <laughs> it's a bit shallow. <laughs> so it's sort of just more like, you know where the, the sandbank suddenly oh, yeah, drops yeah, off? Yeah. So it's kind of like, the whale's cheerleading. This <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mentioned the whale as sort of being out there, but not being near enough to the shore to be able to help because I thought it was funny. And that was my downfall because it meant they had a whale they could later weaponize. Yeah. So I'll be like, don't hurt yourself, but go nudge it. Give him a nudge. Go, go give him a hard nudge. nudge. The boat. And at that point, again, I couldn't exactly say no and put the whale back in the jar. Like, it was it was out of the lamp, there was nothing I could do except let them use it. Suddenly you see, if you're watching the ship, uh, the sails kind of judder. And in fact, the whole ship kind of rocks and you see the people on top deck struggle to keep their feet. Um, as the whale just kind of like beneath the waterline just smashes <laughs> into the boat. It led to the, to be fair, the, the question I've never had to ask myself before, which is how much damage does a whale do? As much as it wants. Exactly. <laughs> it was a trying day at the office. If there was one thing I would say to aspiring DMs who want to neutralize this possibility, it's not to learn all the spells because it will just drive you bonkers and you'll end up hating the game and you won't want to run it. Just get to know your players and what they're like. So if, for example, there's a reason I don't leave red explosive barrels littered all over Geth, because these people work in video games all the time, of course they're going to put them to use. So just try and give them options that they will naturally gravitate towards as and when you want them to use those options and just be wary of throwing things in that are like wide open for abuse because you think it's good flavor text, <laughs> as otherwise you're just gonna be in for a world of hurt. While still ringing the bell, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, there's six, six guys mm -hmm. coming. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. A lot of war hammers, a lot of plate armor. Yep. Grease is still looking good. Grease is in play. Yeah. The grease is in play. Okay, does anyone have any other um, traps or anything we can set down before they <clears throat> get here? I have a special spell called Spike Growth, which basically, means that I can create a spike trap that they will take damage if they walk over it. So just after the grease, okay. mm -hmm. I can put right. down... Maybe they'll slide right into it. Slide a 20-foot twen yeah. radius, I'm gonna cast um, spike nice. growth. So I don't really think anybody around the table expected Meryl Wen's meat grinder, that now infamous incident, <laughs> to be quite as deadly as it was, because the plan was a good one. Grease on the way in at the point of ingress where these paladins are gonna be coming in, and then, oh, a spike trap. That sounds like it might be useful because like, haha, they're gonna slide into it and that's gonna be great. What we didn't realize was just how much damage it does per five foot they were covering. So, we got three. Yeah. 
and four. Yeah. Yeah. Three yes. and one. Uh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. All right. You like... guys are scary now. <laughs> oh, Marilyn. And I thought, well, I'm going to go with this. I've made the saving rolls for the, the paladins. They screwed them up, and then I just rolled arbitrarily to see how far into the trap they got carried by the grease. <laughs> this guy goes, okay, it's uh, six feet, so that's uh, just another 2D. Man, this is a meat grinder. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out far enough to mince them all to death. <laughs> and it was, it was great fun. I think we were all of us. This is the one example of everyone being around the table, just swept away by the force of the derailment together and having a great time with it. But it's the first time I feel like it's gone completely not wrong, but in a very untoward direction, and everyone was on the same page. Next guy stacks it. <laughs> <laughs> Meryl wins meat grinder. <laughs> <laughs> and he goes 10 foot. <laughs> <laughs> he is pretty much like the first guy. He's just like, <laughs> like <laughs> just trying to keep it together. Oh, In fact, no, this guy's not coughing up blood. He's just like holding his feet. Oh, desperately ah, trying ah, to his shredded ah, limbs. Ah, I vomit ah. over the side of the belt. <laughs> I, I put a second eye patch over my <laughs> I don't want to say it was a lovely moment because Egbert threw up afterwards, but it was still, it was, it's definitely a standout moment for me because that combat encounter was planned to be kind of a little siege. I really like giving every now and then my players like a, a building that they're in that they have a few minutes to prepare because there's going to be uh, an assault. That's not something that, that tends to happen when combat breaks out in D&D. In &D. It's more like everyone in the room draws their sword. So to be fair, I can't fault them for coming up with this plan. It was great and exactly kind of what I wanted them to do. I just, I guess I didn't realize that the combat was gonna be over quite so quickly. But in many ways, that's kind of the takeaway from this for any other DMs wanting to give the players opportunities to set traps or prepare or just in combat in general and that's not to get too attached to the scenario and to the idea of it being this heroic back and forth where people are fighting on the ramparts and others are sort of brawling in the dirt or whatever because sometimes it's gonna go wrong and it's gonna be hilarious and it makes for a really memorable moment and again I'm not saying everyone felt good about it but it was definitely a thing. <laughs> and sometimes that's what you need to make sort of the best and longest lasting memories when you're playing a game like D&D. I think a lot of DMC Dungeons and Dragons is kind of players versus the DM. Yeah. Whereas I don't think you view it that way. No, I, 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 it's kind of a very old trope. And I kind of hate it when I see t-shirts being like, I'm the dungeon master, what I say goes, or you know, your fate is in my hands. That's kind of, it's A, not true, because as I've hopefully shown over the last few minutes, that things will go wrong for the DM. And if they're trying to wrench control of that back, that's, you're not really sharing. The whole point of this is it's a collaborative storytelling exercise. And if you're not all collaborating to tell the story, then kind of what's the point? You know, even if it's a story where everyone's covered in minced up paladin. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes it happens. You can't make a good adventure without breaking a few paladins. <laughs> Gets across the grease, runs Pfeiffer into it, like when you runs Pfeiffer out of the radius, <laughs> and then just kind of goes like, <laughs> and just coughs up a load of blood. All right, so that was seven ways your players will derail you. I hope you found it useful, or at least mildly entertaining. If you enjoyed it, I'm going to be doing lots more videos on how to get started in pen and paper role playing over on Dicebreaker, that's youtube.com forward slash Dicebreaker, so do give that a look. And by the magic of the YouTube backend, or possibly just magic, I don't really know how this works, there's a link to Dicebreaker right there, so I'll wait here and you can just click that. Thank you.